I think you heard this morning, both Joel, Don talked about it. The reason we decided to do this session is, one, it's on the top of everybody's mind, obviously, supply chain. Not only from a cost standpoint, but just the sheer availability causes direct impact on what we have from a delivery and in-home, and also what we can do from an optimization standpoint. So some of the things we'll talk about later today in terms of solutions directly get impacted, right? We, we've got this merged mail that's taking off, and then it's limited by the number of envelopes we can get. And just-in-time inventories, you heard that this morning, right? We can't work under those models anymore because that's what caused the problem. So now we have to do inventories, and I'm sure these guys will talk about the amount of money and efforts that we're putting into those things so that we do have the abilities coming into the fall and be able to actually accomplish some of these things that we're out to set out to do. So I, I have a great panel up here because I asked these folks in their respective fields to talk about just that. Where has paper been? Where are we at with a production labor standpoint? Where are we at with freight? Where's the industry? How did we get to where we got to? And then suggestions, again, solutions. How are we going to move forward? What are we doing different? Because the whole world is different right now when it comes to supply chain. And then Joel will help moderate and fill in everything in between. So we have pretty much slide presentations on paper first, and then we'll go into production labor, then go into the freight standpoint, kind of get you up to speed. I'm sure these guys will take any questions as we're going through. And after we get through the presentations, then we'll go into kind of a panel discussion on any kind of questions that you have. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chris, president of Paper Services, to uh, fill us in on all of that. Thanks, Josh. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you. We'll get there soon. So a little bit about uh, what we do in the paper services department at Quad. We buy roughly 800,000 tons of paper per annum. The major grades that we buy are coated groundwood, which is traditionally for catalogs and magazines, special interest publications. We buy coated free sheet as well, which is the thicker stuff, usually used for direct mail, commercial applications, catalogs, newsprint, which is retail inserts, particularly grocery store inserts, uh, super calendar A through B, that's retail inserts as well, catalogs, magazines, and uncoated free sheet, which is really specifically for the direct mail applications. Joel mentioned earlier today about the number of SKUs that we have at Squad from a, at Quad from a paper standpoint. We do have 10,000 SKUs, that's for customer supplied paper, and quad supplied paper. Just for quad supplied, we have 7,000 different roll size, basis weight, location, uh, grade combinations. Taking a look at the top 500 or 550 SKUs in our system, those top 550 represent roughly 80% of the total tonnage that goes through our system. So the other 7,500 7, that we purchase are very small, and that sort, of, uh, that sort of supply chain really isn't very sustainable in the future, but there certainly are opportunities in the future, and I'll get into that a little bit later. How are we addressing that? The first grade I wanna cover is coded grounded, which is coded number four and number five. Back in 2019, there were a little bit over two million tons of, of capacity. Then COVID hit, which precipitated uh, Nine Dragons converting their number 25 machine. New Indy, which was previously Bowwater down in South Carolina, a heavyweight mill, they converted to packaging as well. Nine Dragons, then they converted the number 15 machine in Rumford, Maine, which was very disruptive because they made heavyweight number fours at that mill. And as soon as that shut, they exported all of that capacity into the beer and mill in Wisconsin. So picture this, that machine was all of a sudden making everything in between 28 pound and six, 28 pound number five and 60 pound number four with, with every stop along the way. Fast forward to the third quarter of last year in September, very quickly, then Evergreen shut. And that was an event that really 
uh, wreaked quite a bit of havoc in the industry. That was the final mill that was in operation in the southern United States from a coded standpoint. It also was the final mill that really made a lot of heavyweight. So think 45, 50 pound number five. Now that substrate is really difficult to obtain. And then only a couple of months ago, we, 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 we heard from Nine Dragons that they are planning to shut their coated grounder machine, which is in Buren, Wisconsin. That is scheduled to convert at the very end of this year. So in a very short period of time, three years, we've seen the capacity go down by 68%, from 2.1 million tons down to our best back of the envelope estimate is that we're gonna be left with 665,000 tons at the beginning of next year. So looking at a map of where are today's five paper machines, they're now all in the northern part of the United States and Canada, so it's very difficult to get paper down to the Rock, Georgia, down to Lufkin, down to Tampa. That's one of the challenges that we, that we certainly have. <clears throat> and in the, next, uh, in the next seven months, the North American industry is going to go from five, five machines making number five down to only three machines making coded number five. One in BC, one in Minnesota, one close to Montreal. So it has really uh, changed pretty significantly. And there's also been an announcement by Billerud, which is the old Verso, they're going to convert a machine in 2025. So it continues. Moving to coded free sheet, is, it isn't as dire. In 2019, there were two and a half million tons. At the start of this year, there was roughly one and a half million tons. 40, 40, over 41% of the total capacity has been stricken from the market. It all happened very, very quickly. And it really happened in the, after, in the aftermath of, of coded because the operating rates went down to just above 50%. Now one item that is not in these numbers here is that at the beginning of last year, there were more than 150,000 tons of inventory on top of the rated capacity that was sitting in warehouses that the mills were building up in the last half of 2020. It only took about six months for all that inventory to flush through the system. And since the middle of last year, there really isn't any web inventory that we can draw from and purchase. So this slide here looks at uh, all coded grades. What have the operating rates been since uh, the first quarter of 2018? That's the last time we had a pretty tight cycle. You can see coded free sheet, which is right around 100% the capacity. And even looking at coded free sheet at the, end of, at the end of 20 and the beginning of 21, the operating rates were at about 105%. That simply means that all the paper machines that are running flat out, and at the same time, they're drawing down their inventories. So that's why they can ship more than what their rated capacity is. Moving to super calendar, this is the one grade in the industry that has not uh, seen enormous amounts of capacity reductions. There's only been one machine that has been taken out since 2019, and that was Verso's Duluth machine. And the reason why that one was taken out is because it was operating in the United States. They were competing against three companies in Canada, and with the exchange rates, the Canadians, the loonies been between 70 and 85 the last several years. So with the exchange rate, the Canadians have had significant competitive advantage. And as we, as we look at the landscape today, all three remaining operations are, are in Quebec, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick, all up in the eastern part of Canada. So it's, again, it's very difficult for us to get any super calendared paper west of the Mississippi, Merced especially. It's a very 
very long supply chain and very, very difficult. Newsprint, that's the one grade that uh, is starting to open up quite a bit. There's, there's capacity that is definitely available. But right as, right as COVID hit, there were six mills that were shut almost immediately in a very rapid succession because the operating rates were so poor and they did not see any end in sight. Of the remaining capacity that we have of two and a half million tons, roughly 1.6 or 1.7 million tons is for domestic consumption in the United States and Canada. The balance it all is exported to Europe and to Asia as well. Back in, uh, back in 2020, when the newspapers were in their heyday, this market actually had 13 million tons. So between 2020 and today, there's been more than 10 million tons that have been removed from the newsprint market. This is what remains for newsprint in North America. As you can see, the vast majority is in Canada and the state of Washington. There's only one machine, which is in Grenada, Mississippi, owned by Resolute that, that manufactures uh, in the southern United States. So that is the machine that services Lufkin, a little bit of Winchester, and all of Tampa for us. The reason why the vast majority of the machines are in Canada is because that really is where the fiber basket is, which is really important to newsprint. In North America, every single machine that remains is not making any paper from recycled, uh, recycled old newspapers. Everything is virgin fiber, which is very different from what we're seeing in Asia. In Asia, there's a, a six and a half million tons, so that market is two and a half times as big as the newsprint market in North America. In Japan, there's three million tons. A lot of newspapers still getting circulated in Japan. Two thirds of those tons are fully integrated, so one third is at risk for getting shut. You look at the rest of Asia, all of the capacity in India and in China, all of it is manufactured by gathering old newspapers, so it's all recycled, and that product is getting more difficult to secure. So in the future, of the newsprint market, we kind of believe that there's a lot of machines that are at risk in Asia, that everything will probably remain in operation in Canada, so we're still gonna have plenty access to newsprint in the future, but also notice that there's a whole bunch of machines that are on the St. Lawrence Seaway, which means that as the machines shut in Asia and Europe in the future, they're gonna have access to Europe and to Asia quite easily. This slide here kind of rolls up what we've seen in the last three years for capacity. So between 2019 and now, roughly 40% of all the available capacity has been taken out. The secular decline that we've actually seen is probably 25, 30%. So there is a little bit of a shortage and it'll probably take a little bit of time yet for the secular decline to take hold again to catch up with the available paper capacity hoping that nothing gets taken out of the market in the future. One of the reasons why the price has rallied so much in the last couple of years is all the competition that the printing and writing paper mills are getting, a lot of it is from packaging suppliers. They all use the same pulp, and that's where the majority of it is going, so the price has been ramped up pretty rapidly. Um, it's it's rallied by more than 50%, and RISI's latest forecast shows that we're probably at the peak pricing right now for pulp, so hopefully that will translate into a peaking of paper prices very, very soon. They also have you know, significant cost inflation and in all the other raw materials that they utilize. This slide, this slide shows where are the mill inventories because historically paper mills, 
they would have a lot of inventory as they would go through peak cycles and bust cycles. Whenever they were in a bust, they would just keep the paper machines running and they would build their inventory so they could service customers, especially in the third quarter of the year. At the very beginning of 2020, which is, uh, which is right after Verso shut a couple of mills, they purposely put almost a half a year of inventory because they knew that they would have to have a lot of paper to service their clients. And uh, as soon as early 21 hit, the coded free sheet uh, inventory just, just plummeted. And today, every single grade is sitting at less than 30 days. So what that means is there really isn't any paper rolls that are sitting in any warehouses out there. It's really the work in process that they have. So everything is getting made and it's get shipped immediately. That's what we're faced with right now. In addition, um, you know, the inventories inside all of Quad's warehouses, if you look at it on a year over year basis, they're pretty flat. But in the very near future, we're gonna start to see the inventories rise because all of our inventories, uh, all of our, all of our allocations, I should say, they we're getting one twelfth of our allocation every single month. But we know that roughly 40% of our demand hits in the fall of the year. So the only way that we're gonna have enough paper to survive the busy, the, the peaky part of the year is to, is to put inventories on the floor, which is what we are doing right now. But as soon as we hit August, it's going to uh, get consumed pretty quickly. One thing that we monitor pretty, uh, pretty closely as well is, is the exchange rates from Europe and from Canada. Whenever, whenever, the, uh, whenever the euro is under 130, it's advantageous for the European mills to ship more paper into the United States. And just since the beginning of this year, the euro was at 120, just today it's at 105. So thankfully, the UPM labor strike has been resolved. They're back to making paper now. And we, we're certainly encouraging them to ship more paper in the future. And especially with the currency where it is today, we hope that we're gonna see more than our fair share of paper coming into the United States from Finland and other parts of the EU as well. The Looney has been pretty stable. That's pretty much a petrol-based currency economy. So it's really been stable. And anytime it gets above 85 or 90, that's when the Canadians are gonna be interested in shipping paper to other parts of the world. But we expect stability. And the last forecast I looked at for the euro, we're expecting parity by the end of this year. So that bodes well for, for increasing imports in the future. One slide on RISI's uh, uh, forecast for prices. They're forecasting that there's gonna be a slight up uptick yet in the third quarter of this year, but then no more increases after that. We believe that, that there should be no more increases anytime in the future. We're kind of at a breaking point right now, so we are encouraging all of our suppliers to hold the line and to find a way to not raise the price because that could really severely impact demand in the future. So we, we are negotiating with all of our suppliers right now Every single paper mill right now, they're all talking about 2023 because 2022, it's gone. It's sold out. We're having very high level, very strategic, serious conversations with all of our suppliers and every one of them, they're all evaluating their entire customer base. They're trying to figure out who's gonna thrive in five years, who's gonna survive in 10. And they're all surmising that Quad is one of their preferred customers. One of the benefits that we bring to the marketplace is with our concentration of plants in the Wisconsin area especially, there's a high concentration of paper that is made in the area as well. So since paper is FOB destination, 
it's important to be as close as you possibly can be to the, to the source of the paper. Paper mills also really are advantaged when, when they can ship more rail and, and we have big plants, mega plants in Wisconsin that can ship enormous amounts of paper by rail. Of course, we have great financial strength and we are talking to our suppliers that we want to be at Quad, we want to be their best customer that they have ever seen. So we're taking a lot of measures right now to make sure that we're going to be reliable, we want to be predictable, we want to help them with real efficiency gains through buying the sweet spot of every machine. Just because a machine makes between 28 and 60 pound, it doesn't mean that every one of those basis weights is good for the machine. That machine in particular, at Nine Dragons and Buren, when that machine was built, it was designed to make 30 to 34 pound number five. There's no way that machine should be making 60 pound number four, but when markets get super loose, every paper mill is willing to make every grade and every basis weight for anybody. And you order paper today, it'll be in your plant within two weeks. Much different today. And the one thing that we have really been working on very hard at Quad is we want to standardize our offerings. Earlier I talked about the fact that the top 550 SKUs represent 80% of our throughput. One of the programs that, that we have introduced in the state of Wisconsin is we've introduced inventory programs on 40 and 45 pound coded number five along with 40 through 50 pound number four. Now we're covering two by four presses, two by six presses, and two by eight presses. And the trim sizes are everything in between seven and three quarters and eight and three eighths. So that represents a big percentage of all the catalogs and the magazines that, that go through our system. We are we are also inventorying 60 through, through 80 pound and 100 pound coated free sheet in a couple of different roll sizes. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with our progress in that program. Just in the last 45 days, we have increased our inventories by 25%. We've really wanted to boost the inventories in the standardization program. And the goal, at least initially, is to try to have a 45-day buffer so then if there's a run on the inventory or if there's you know, any, any hiccups uh, that we can react to it as best as we can. So we're pretty pleased with the progress so far. There's another area that we're hitting for standardization. We've been working really hard with the, uh, with the design team in the direct mail space. And we've discovered that the two most popular SKUs that we run in the direct mail system is 60 pound uncoated free and 80 pound number three mat. If you look at just 60 pound uncoated free sheet, in between 11 inches and 38 inches, in the, in the last 12 months, we have bought over 100 different roll sizes. There's almost every increment of one eighth, one eighth of an inch that is going through our, through our system. And those 100 roll sizes, the bottom 50, it's two tons of this, 11 tons of that. It's only 4% of the total throughput. So we're gonna try to eliminate those onesies and twosies and try to really concentrate. We've come up with, with six different roll sizes for Pewaukee, for Chalfont and for Effingham, and we just, we're just starting right now to boost those inventories, and the intent is to really help our direct mail customers because our lead times today for paper are 16, 20 weeks, and a lot of our direct mail customers, they wanna drop something in in a two-week period or a four or a six-week period, and we've really had a difficult time servicing all those needs we want to be able to really help those customers and to have inventories so when the quick drop-in jobs come in, we can say yes. We want to say yes. We're also doing a, a, 
We're starting to do some work on retail inserts. Just taking Tampa, for example, you know, retail inserts, it's really all the same basis weight. There are four, six, eight page standards. You would think that we'd only have a couple of roll sizes through the system, but a lot of grocery stores, they want little pop-ups, gatefolds, all kinds of tricks to add to their marketing campaigns. That means there's just a plethora of different roll sizes that we run. Just the top six SKUs in Tampa, that's well over 70% of all the paper that we run through. So hopefully customers will be able to standardize. Then, and part of our problem is in Tampa and in Lufkin, there's one paper mill that can service them. But if that mill ever goes down, the closest paper mill is gonna be up in Quebec. And that supply chain, we, we cannot buy truckloads of newsprint that really is designed to come in rail cars. And if we whittle it down to just a few SKUs, we're gonna be able to support a limited number of, of roll sizes and just ship rail car after rail car down to an outside warehouse down south and kind of distribute everything from there. But we will then be able to you know, not, have, not have the issues that, that we have today. The supply chain is broken. And I'm kind of embarrassed to say that 60% of our orders today, they're late. Early in my career, it was a cardinal sin to shut a press down because paper wasn't there. But now it hap it's happening every day. And that's one of our major efforts, is to try to figure out how do we get paper on time so we can run more productive. That's it. Thank you. How's everyone doing? <laughs> uh, it, it reminds me, I'm going to date myself because I, I reference Seinfeld a lot, but it just reminds me of George Costanza, Costanza just saying, Serenity now! <laughs> so it's not, all these problems are common uh, with all of our businesses. And it's not something that we feel is unsurmountable. And so I think first and foremost, I just want to thank you all for being customers, clients of Quad, and also for your partnership. But let me come back to the word partnership a little bit. I'm Dave Honan. I'm Quad's chief operating officer. I started that role on January 1st. Uh, Joel um, asked me to step into a new role. I was previously the CFO of the company. <laughs> Please don't turn on Joel's mic. <laughs> Joel calls me a reformed CFO. I tell my team, my new team in operations, um, boy, now I get to be part of the solution for all the problems I created as a CFO. And during the last two years, think about like the whipsaw we've all been on in our businesses. Thank you, Chris. From the start of pandemic, in this industry alone, we faced a 40% volume decline into April of 2020. And then you fast forward to the next year of COVID and we're going into our busiest time of the year and all of a sudden volumes are up 20%. And so as a business you reacted to that. You adjusted staffing levels and you took out costs, but then you had to add it all back in. And what did that do to the business? It just sent it through a shockwave. And, and, and Don referred to it early this morning. We didn't perform well last year. I'm not making any excuses for how we perform. But in part and parcel, it's the environment we're all in and, and trying to react to changing conditions really quickly. So, um, you know, the second thing I want to leave you with today is we're ready for this peak season this year. We're going to perform well for you. Uh, we feel really good about where we're at. Um, I think we're going to find a way to get all the paper you need. I mean, Chris and his team are outstanding. Um, and we'll definitely have the ability in all of our facilities to perform extremely well for you, get your products out on time, and not repeat a year like we had last year as we were adjusting to the, the, the rebound of the pandemic. So that's the second point. And let, let me walk through kind of the whys here for you. Hey, that's a good looking picture. <laughs> All right. Yeah. 
So the current economy, and, and, and really this just demonstrates what we've been through. Unemployment rate, and this is dated now, this is as of March, 3.6%. The country is headed below pre-pandemic le levels on unemployment. At the same time, we're facing inflation. So you've, you've heard it all this morning. I wanted to point out, though, um, when you look at the producer price index, which is the um, top, the blue line on this, on this slide uh, to the right, uh, to the left um, uh, chart, this, there's one specific for printing industry, and it's, you know, it shows you up 17% inflation rate, and it's increasing. We heard from the post office today, you know, postal rates are going up. Labor always lags in inflationary economy because we have to pay our people more to offset the cost of inflation. So that's what we're managing to. Um, but, but unemployment and the tight labor market that we all face in this country today is really where it's been one of our strategic focuses. And let me just cap up on, on strategic focus. There's four things that we want to do really, really well for our business and for our customers to perform well. First is we want to attract and we want to retain great talent. And that bodes well for everybody uh, as we perform throughout the busy season. Second thing we want to do is we want to enhance and fix the supply, supply chain constraints. And you've heard about what's going on with paper. You hear a little bit about uh, freight. But that's where partnership comes in. Because to fix the supply chain, we're all partners in that supply chain, and it's gonna take partnership across the board when we're talking about things like standardization to help fix and strengthen the supply chain so there's a future in this mode of communication and advertising and marketing. Uh, you know, third thing that we're really focused on is investment back into the platform. So we have the, great, the best technology, the most advanced technology, and a lot of that's about automation. That's also to help do things on a lower cost basis, more sustainable, but in a very tight labor market where demographically, we see this challenge into the future. This is not gonna go away. Uh, you know, some people think a recession fixes kind of the shortage of labor. I think given the demographic shift in the US, um, we're, this is gonna be with us for a while, even if there is a recession. We're gonna still struggle, all of us, with, with the tight labor supply. You know, and, and really the fourth area, and we'll continue to focus on, as you've heard about, you know, really a standardization through our plans. But let's talk, let's talk with about the most important thing right now, is hiring great talent and retaining them. And so uh, Quad, which hey, you get to see a colorful slide here, and this is the result of our great creative capabilities at Quad. Uh, we have a, a, this is done by our Periscope creative agency out of Minneapolis, also has offices in Chicago. Look at the great work they do. But this is something where Joel re referenced 50 million of investment into talent. Now 25 million of that, half of that, is really gone into hiring people at a higher wage. So we raised our starting wages at Quad, and then all the related wages above that got compressed, and we've also increased that. That's above and beyond what we do on a normal merit cycle uh, for annual raises. So 25 million just put into wages to attract talent because we found ourselves not being able to compete in the economies that we need to hire that labor from. But another uh, quarter of that investment has gone into training. We've rethought how we train our employees. Joel referenced we started hiring uh, employees in January of this year for our peak busy season. We normally do that in June. That six months, we spent a lot of time really thinking through how do we onboard people better? How do we train them? Um, and how do we keep them more focused on delivering great results for our customers? And oh, by the way, how do we change the environment where people see a career path and that we're investing in them to be part of the future at Quad? So a, a lot of work been put into that. And the final quarter is just kind of what you're looking at here, incentives. So to attract talent these days, you have to do signing bonuses. We do recruitment bonuses to people who refer people into Quad. Uh, we've enhanced uh, our shifts, so now if you work a night shift at Quad, you get an incremental $3 an hour. We've changed shifts. You know, if for those of you who've been long-time long -time customers at Quad, we always prided ourselves on these 12-hour shifts. We did 12 hours, and it rotated days to nights throughout your year. We've, we looked at all those things. We've gone from 12-hour shifts, we still have those, to eight-hour shifts. You can lock into a shift. You can always work nights if you want. You can always work days if you want. And we just added this increased flexibility into how we are providing uh, careers for people and how they work those hours at Quad. So a lot of time and effort gone into this. So $50 million of investment over the past year uh, to get 
the feet on the floor, the great talent to deliver for you. But it doesn't stop there. We can't afford to pay all that money to recruit great talent and to not keep it. And so retention has been a huge focus for us. You'll see these are this lists out 24 projects we've been working on uh, for retention. But you can see well over a quarter of those projects are about career development pathways um, at Quad. Not, not solely focused on total rewards or your comp, but how do we create a career for people in this industry long term? So a lot of work been put into this. We continue to work on this long term. It's not where we want it to be. I don't know if it ever is where you want it to be in terms of retention, but this is a big focus for us moving forward. And it's had results. So this slide has a lot on it, a lot of numbers, but we have a goal this year in, in our mega plant. So we have 31 printing plants in the US. Okay, 24 of those really operate within probably where most of the customers in this room are. We had a goal to hire 421 people up for this busy season. We've hired 220 to date. I would tell you, we have enough people hired at this point to already deliver on our busy season. So if we didn't get one more person into our network, that's why we feel confident that we can deliver. Now the additional 200 people is going to be deliver on sustainability to, to build, um, not work our work, not to put too many hours on our workers to really build that career path that we've been talking about from a retention standpoint. But we feel really good about where this is at. Compare that to a year ago, going into busy season, we needed to hire 700 people, okay? 700 people, and by the time we got to busy season, we had hired 200. So we were 500 short. And here we are a year later saying, we probably got enough to get us through at this point, and we're sitting in the beginning of May. And we won't really peak out until uh, August timeframe. So feeling really good about where things stand, operationally deliver for you, uh, to get uh, in-home dates, uh, you know, right now we're 95% on time home deliveries, and really that 5% cushion is just because of late deliveries on paper. So um, I really feel good about uh, the situation right now and as we're moving forward. And I, I think you should all feel confident uh, that as you bring work into Quad, we will, you know, we will find you that paper. We will find you uh, the ability to hit in-home dates uh, as we move forward. So thanks for your time. I'll turn it over to Kelly Vanderbroom. Wrong way. Let's go back this way. There we go. <laughs> I'm gonna hear about this for a while. <laughs> All right, I'm Kelly Vanderboom. Uh, rolls a little bit of a, I, I like to call it a platypus. It doesn't quite look right, but it works. Um, I'm up here to talk to you about logistics today. So um, a little bit about us uh, before I get into the broader market. Um, you know, we manage, or are lucky enough to manage four billion pounds a year of your product. Um, we take it seriously, we're multimodal. Um, we're the only player in this industry that owns their own trucks, that controls a significant amount of capacity 24-7. That's a really big deal in a tight freight market. When things are loose and you can you know, pick up a phone, get paper whenever you want, get a truck whenever you want, owning your own, not that big of a deal. But when it's tough to find somebody, uh, having somebody to deploy with a blue uniform on really makes a difference. So about a fifth of our deliveries are on folks and assets that we control 24-7. Um, so how the heck did we get here? Um, it's a remarkable time. I mean, I grew up in logistics, um, been around a couple of decades now, and I've never seen anything like it. Uh, 2020, the world shut down, and there was a plethora of trucks. And you'll see in a couple of slides, spot rates dropped, a lot of things changed. Um, that was really an issue when the economy came back. A ton of truckers uh, left the marketplace. The average age of a trucker in this country is in the mid-50s, okay? So it was especially hard hit by COVID. Uh, economy comes back, and then I think everybody remembers the deep freeze that occurred uh, in the front half of 21. Three quarters of the country was literally frozen. 
um, and it really backed up the supply chain. Things just got out of whack, not only in 20, but during that deep freeze. Containers in the wrong spots, trucks out of place, a lot of people off the road, and then somebody tried to go up sideways up the Suez Canal, that didn't work out, and back <laughs> things up. So, I mean, a, a lot has happened, and then underlying this, something that folks, you know, if you're not in the logistics market, you hadn't heard about, and I think it's a good thing, is the feds came up with a drug clearinghouse. It used to be, this is just an analogy, Kelly, you know, is positive for some kind of a drug and he drives for XYZ Trucking Company. He would be let go and then would go to another trucking company, apply, and as long as he was negative on the test, Kelly's driving again. The feds got rid of that, um, good thing, but what has happened is 90,000 truckers have you know, been positive. Well, only 20,000 stayed in the industry. The other 70,000 found something else to do because you know, they didn't maybe want to address that issue. So okay? Still I'm, still, I'm still negative, and apparently I'm going to have to test after this as well, I guess. So, you know, it, the market is 80,000 truckers short. So when you take 70 out over a two-year span because of this process, again, good process. We need safe trucks out on the market. It exacerbates what's going on in the marketplace. And then I'll get into the, the ports in a little bit. You know, there was a 60 minutes uh, on the you know, Long Beach port, I think it was like last September, talking about, boy, there's, there's 90 ships out there and some of them have been out there for a couple of weeks. Well, the beginning of this year, there's 110 out there. Okay, so that, that part of it continues to unwind and then we'll talk about freight in a moment. But a lot going on in a broad, broad market. We're not just talking print here, we're talking logistics um, around North America. So the big debate right now, if you talk to, if you're responsible for or talk to the folks that do you know, logistics within your shops, is, is this market becoming looser and stabilizing for a shipper, or is it just a calm before the storm before another part of the supply chain whips us and we go back into a tight market? And I'm gonna go into a little bit of content. You can make up your own mind, um, but there are certainly arguments for both. Um, you can see here, DAT is a really big trade um, shop that gets fed analytics, rates, et cetera, by a broad swath of players, including Quad. We uh, subscribe to it. And you can see the yellow line here is a blend of spot rates for dry van, think, you know, printed product going out on trailers, okay? Um, you can see at the beginning of the pandemic, kind of in the mid-dollar range, spikes up when the economy comes back, there's a little bit of a lull, then we have the deep freeze and the sideways ship, again, boom, up, 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 until you know January and February was the worst I've ever seen it. It wasn't so much what you were paying for a truck, it was could you find a truck, okay? And that's just a, that's a radically different place. Um, it has come off. If you talk to people, spot rates out in the market have come off by about 20% since the peak, but they're up, you know, 40% since the pandemic began and call it, you know, 12% since the beginning of January. This is a blend. Um, of these rates. So this is a little bit of spot, little bit of contract. Um, good to see capacity freed up. Trucks are out there, you're paying a hell of a lot more, um, and it's, it's, it's obviously good to see it backed off from, from a point that we've never seen. Um, other part, uh, you might see kind of a posting of how many loads are posted. You'll read about this in newspaper articles. There's, there's 15 loads for every driver that's you know, running around out there, that kind of stuff, and you know, we hit 12 in January. So I think you know, 12 Kellys calling Joel to try to move the product, all right? That's a tough situation to be in, but it has really come off, and that's why you see the availability, that's why you see the contract rates uh, coming down a little bit. Second quarter is always a little bit of a seasonal lull. 
okay? It's right before produce season when it starts to ramp up. So you would naturally expect to see it loosen up. It's loosened up a little bit more than I think a seasonal argument um, would make. And then the last point, um, at least for the, the argument for loosening or stabilization, um, is, is tender rejections, okay? Uh, you might, you know, XYZ carrier have a contract and say, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna handle 10 loads a week uh, from origin point A to B, okay? And then you call them on those 10 loads, and then sometimes they're giving them back, sorry, don't have the truck, or, you know, come up with X, some idea, you know, whatever, a reason, you know, truck breakdown, et cetera. We were going through a period where rejections were 25%. So every four times you called somebody, they were rejecting and turning one back to you. Okay, that's a really high number. Why is that? Well, the spot market was super, super hot. And if Kelly was gonna spend, you know, pay you $1,000 to haul the load, but Joel was gonna pay you 1,500, every, you know, one out of every four times, they're taking Joel's load. Okay, that's, that's the reality of what's happening. You can see that rate coming down to now under 10%. The spot market's coming down, Joel's no longer offering 1,500 bucks, he's offering 950. Well, they're, they're taking the 1,000. So again, a loosening of capacity, a lowering of the spot market, um, you know, certainly uh, great to see after end of 21, early 22, which were, uh, you know, brutal. Having said that, there are storm clouds that sit out there. Uh, number one, China's effectively shut down. So you have 10% of global shipping waiting to jump on ships and move to various places, including here. All right, the 110 that I you know, showed you in Long Beach at the beginning of January, it's down to about 40 right now. They've kind of caught up. It's because all the, all the ships and the containers are over on the other side of the pond, okay? So um, it's gonna be really interesting for this fall season. I've heard you know, retailers and marketers trying to get product over here early. Um, hard to do when China is effectively um, shut down, and that could be a little bit of a whipsaw that we've seen through COVID as you kind of catch up, then you fall behind, then you catch up, uh, because everything is discombobulated and out of balance. Mexico, um, there was a mandate by uh, the governor of Texas to put a new inspection process in place uh, that by most accounts, uh, duplicated what was already there. So you can see on the left-hand side of this slide, there's a real picture where they're narrowing down the entire border down to one truck at a time getting inspected, and it just goes back for miles. Crazy time, okay? It got unwound. They said, uh, you know, bad idea. Let's, let's do that over. But it backed things up for 10 days, and it's still unwinding, okay? So the Mexican market, the border is a little bit challenged. And then, you know, I think there was some talk earlier about the convoy in Canada. That is still a very difficult region. Costs there are two and a half, you know, times at least what they were just at the end of the year. Um, a lot of truckers have come out of that market. That's still a very difficult market, um, and there's time involved there. So U.S. truckload doing okay? Our borders not doing great? China backed up, and it remains to be seen, is there enough happening in truck to loosen rail and loosen LTL, both of which are still very difficult, okay? Uh, we'll see, we'll see. Um, you know, it's obviously a fluid situation uh, that you know, we're, we got our fingers on the, on the pulse of. I, I'm not gonna hit fuel prices too heavily. Everybody knows it when they stop by the pump, um, but I mean, $5 a gallon, uh, we've had situations within pricing where we had to you know, update fuel surcharge tables because it just didn't contemplate these types of uh, levels. So I'm um, clearly worried that that's gonna take some, some uh, you know, wind out of the sails of the, the end consumer. So uh, what's coming up? 
Um, still a fragmented industry. I think it's important for folks in here to understand that the longshoremen out west, their, their contract comes up in July. So if we have a ton of boats coming here from China and people decide to go on strike in July, that's one thing to watch. Knock on wood, that doesn't happen, um, but, but worrisome. Um, I talk a bunch to folks about, boy, should you have a 20-year-old or an 18-year-old driving um, a tractor trailer down the road? Um, a lot of sides to that debate. They're obviously doing that in the military. Uh, but if you look at this little pie chart, it's pretty small, so I'll quote it for you. We have more drivers in this country over 65 years old than we do under 25. Okay? <laughs> that is a problem. Um, and when average drivers are in the mid-50s, it is causing a demographic, continued demographic problem um, going on. The 80,000 driver shortage I talked about, um, that's been exacerbated by the clearinghouse, but again, for good reason. So what I would tell you is, this is a cyclical process. I think the long-term prospects for trucking and logistics in this country will remain tight for the foreseeable future. It might ebb and flow a little bit, but I think this is a long-term demographic problem, a little bit aligned to what Dave was talking about in terms of labor, demographics, et cetera. And then finally, hey, you know, okay, I mean, that's the market, but Kelly, we pay you to navigate the market. We pay you to make print as relevant as possible, deliver it on time for the most cost-efficient way that you can. What are you doing with the dollars that we give you as clients? Just did a broad RFP and increased our carrier base by 10%, uh, which we feel uh, is a great uh, success. We're reinvesting in the assets that we have under our control in Duplainville Transport by 25% to make sure that we are still the, you know, the last line of defense, the protective you know, capacity that's necessary. When things go bump in the night, they do go bump in the night. We're going to deliver on time. We hold carriers accountable. Go back to them with scorecards. Use that in our RFPs, and that's super important. Uh, we're moving around LTL, that's a really tough marketplace. And ultimately, uh, you know, a little bit what Chris was talking about um, on, you know, being the partner of choice. The last thing a trucking firm wants to do is show up to Sussex, Wisconsin, as nice as our grounds are, uh, to pick up a load and they sit there for six hours or 12 hours and then run out of hours, all of that. So, Having wait times under an hour, which we're achieving and have been achieving, really big deal to turn those folks, use those assets for those carriers. So um, investing in our business, we're being the carrier of choice and at the end of the day, uh, delivering on time uh, for each of you. So with that, turn it over to, uh, to our MC. Is this Mike? Hello, testing, there we go. Well, so I, th I think a big part of the goal of what we're trying to do um, during these times is also be really transparent with you about what are the drivers, because I think the more we can educate you in terms of, you know, the what I called the trifecta before, whether it's paper, postage, you know, print, um, you know, what are those underlying drivers so you can understand and help manage. Um, you know, the other thing is, is we wanna try and provide solutions and, you know, we touched on them and I'll make sure we keep this more a conversational, but I do have a couple questions. And the first one is a data um, sort of update. Kelly and I and Tony at lunch were able to have uh, lunch with one of our big banking relationships. He's the probably number two or three in the largest bank out there in the commercial side. And so we started talking about some of these things. And the key takeaways I had, and Kelly, keep me honest and add to it, was if you were thinking about supply chain kind of settling down two months ago, he says everybody's got that off the table, everyone's hunkering down for a long-term supply chain disruption. And so, you know, again, you, you're probably not surprised by that, but these guys are dealing with everybody. Um, that was, that was uh, one of the big takeaways that I had. Kelly, what, did you have any others that they sort of brought up? Well, you know, he, he certainly pointed to China 
and the backup. You know, that, that is a huge economy. It's a huge shipping lane for pretty much everybody in this room. And that's going to unwind over a course of years, not weeks. Well, it, and I, the thing that concerned me about Shanghai and, and the port there is they do think that some of the unwinding and that potential wave that could hit us again on the ports, you know, may coincide for our holiday season, you know, as we get into the fall. And so just a data point, something to, to keep track of. Um, Chris, you know, when you talked about um, on, on the paper side and, you know, did a, did a good advertisement for your paper services, but I think one of the things we're trying to advertise for most is that whole thing about standardization. And, and I think the point that I've pushed and I've talked to some of you about where Quad's trying to actually supply more paper uh, than we do now, about 50% is what we supply. Um, some of the main drivers is to keep our presses running. We've had a lot of disruption um, that we can't control. When we can control it, we have a fighting chance. Um, but also, what was, uh, you know, maybe not as clear, but I think was implied, was we're trying to shift from buying rolls of paper from a mill to buying machine capacity. Can you kind of expand on that and why that's important? You used that sort of idea of the choo-choo train the other day with me of continually going back and forth with large ro uh, loads? So yes, we're talking with all of our suppliers to increase the amount of tonnage that we buy in the future. And we want to be the best customer that they have. And what we have to do is we have to buy in full rail car quantities. One of our suppliers, who's kind of local, we said, what, what would happen if we would buy 100,000 tons from your mill in the future? you would probably be shipping three rail cars every single day into the state of Wisconsin. And you'd have that choo-choo train going back and forth from your mill into Wisconsin, which would be a really efficient supply chain. But the other part of that point was you would be ordering it based on much larger runs with consistent trim. If we take a look at our suppliers and we narrow it down to two or three or four basis weights, we can pre-plan way in advance. And as we pre-plan and standardize the roll sizes, we can essentially give a paper mill a schedule for the entire year. So then they can take our business and schedule their business long term. So they're not going to be at risk of shutting down two weeks down the road. They know that they're going to have good, stable business. And if they come into April or May in the future and they have a lack of additional orders, if they know that these are our standards, they can always pull up June, July, August orders, make them, put them in an inventory, but it allows the whole engine to be efficient as possible and not take downtime. And Dave, um, you talk about demographics. You, I think you were sort of talking generally, but actually what Quad's dealing with is manufacturing demographics. You know, when you think about um, operators, when you think about machinists, can you comment a little bit more on that? Because that's a little bit different than if you look at the overall demographics in the country. Yeah, uh, you know, specific to Quad, when I, when I threw up the unemployment rate for the country, and then that's quickly going down to pre-pandemic levels, for Quad specifically, in the counties that we hire around our facilities, our unemployment rate's less than 2%. That's full employment. So, um, you know, what we've been uh, trying to do is find new sources of talent for our plants. So an example of that is, uh, so Hartford, Wisconsin, about a 45 minute drive from here, uh, we've actually been hiring locally here in Milwaukee and helping transport those people to and from our Hartford facility. Those people happen to come from some of the most underprivileged zip codes in Milwaukee, where unemployment rates in a, in a couple of those zip co codes approach 20%. And when I re reference uh, retention, uh, retention is a, a lot of what we've been focused on is how do we make our plants more hospitable for, and more inclusive for different, uh, for different people. So the people that are coming from Milwaukee, mostly black, Hispanic, are going into a very white um, county of, in, in city of Hartford, Wisconsin. How do we make their environment more hospitable, more inclusive? And we spent a lot of time as, as a company, really started by you, Joel, uh, with the George Floyd uh, uh, murder in, in Minneapolis to really rethink 
how we uh, attack DEI within the four walls of Quad. So 40 of our, 40 of our newest um, talented associates in Hartford, Wisconsin come from Milwaukee, Wisconsin in the most underprivileged zip code. So these are the types of programs we're trying to do. And we're actually, it's, it's really difficult stuff to do. Um, I had a person stop me, part of one of these cohort groups, in, in which we've got a cohort group of 10 starting this week in Hartford, say to me, this is his first legal job. I said, oh, your first job. He goes, no, no, first legal job. He goes, I've worked, it's just not been legal. And, and that just kind of caught, you know, that set me back a little bit. I was like, boy, we really have to approach how we train people differently and, and, and to really teach them about like all the life skills around uh, employment at Quad. So just a small kind of sample of kind of the things we're trying to, to hire up in our facilities and, we've, and, it's, and it's been working. So back to, you know, I mentioned we're investing heavily in you all, right, to make sure we perform. Um, labor is one of them. Um, you touched on increasing the size of our trucking fleet. What, what's the, what's the um, total investment to increase our own trucks by 25%? Um, it was about, am I on here? Oh, there we go. Uh, it was about $5 million, you know, lease. But the importance is, remember, trucking is very seasonal, right? And so we contract with a lot of these outside firms, but we still don't control them. As much as we hold them accountable, we do all that. So there was a time when quad logistics years ago, the own trucks were the majority of it. But at one point, it made more sense to flop that, but we always chose to stay owning the trucks so that we could have that protective capacity, not for the light time of the year, for the time it really matters to control it. And so, you know, that was a, another big shift we're doing this year is really, really beef that up. I'm gonna pause here because we've thrown a bunch of different perspectives at you and I'd like to open it up to the audience a little bit so you can direct us on what you wanted to hear more about and uh, where you want us to go. Come on, this is never a quiet crowd. Joel, I'll start by I, saying I something it, nice. You know, <laughs> but for, forever we were a just-in-time paper ma management. I mean, we've transitioned, we're testing a new program of almost in time, and your, your, your team has done a phenomenal job of dealing with our late deliveries and adjusting press dates and pulling off and going back on, and I just want to thank you for that because that's been a tremendous help. Well, Chad, I'm glad you brought that up, and maybe we could keep the mics on so we don't go in and out, but but can you talk about the disruption that, that what happens on our side to do that? Yeah, you know, when you think about throughput, and I, I mentioned 31 facilities here in the U.S. Last week, we lost 10% of our capacity to late paper deliveries, right? 10%. When you think about that, that's 8,500 employees if you take 10% of 8,500 employees, that's 850 people that had downtime due to late paper deliveries. Uh, one particular customer, because of the late paper, was 160 machine hours that was down just last week. Every week we're facing that. And so it's really how do you adjust to that? And it's in, this is where what I, I brought up the word partnership. It, it, this is going to take the entire supply chain working together to try to fix those types of situations. But the, but the implication, it's, it's, it's not just the downtime, but a lot of times we have to go in and out then. So maybe we have enough paper to run for six hours, then you go down and you have a three hour make ready, go into something else until the next paper comes to try and stand online. And look, that's our commitment. We're always gonna try and do that, especially in these times. But it's also important that everyone understand the repercussions, because that all, again, then speaks to cost, right? And, and when we go and announce a price increase like we've had to, you know, there's, there's a lot involved there. So the more efficient we can all be on this stuff and think about, you know, what you're talking about with, okay, maybe not just in time anymore, almost in time, maybe get to most of the time. Um, but, but, but that will come from, I think, industry, you know, thinking a little bit differently collectively here. Other questions? So, so I got a question then too. He's, oh, God, so, it's still Chad. Okay. I'm not going to give this up for a little bit. <laughs> so, Chris, I hear you saying, basically, I'm buying every pound of paper I can get my hands on, which 
and you're saying all the right things in terms of standardizing roll widths, evening out machine time. I mean, those are the conversations we're trying to have. I only have 150,000 tons to do it with as opposed to the 800,000 tons that you have. But my question is, when we're all out there going, trying to buy every pound of paper that's out there, are we artificially gonna keep the prices high because they're gonna see this demand and we're buying paper, especially you guys who have jobs that may or may not ha you know, have paper coming in with a job planned for, are we keeping the paper h price high because we think that there's this demand that may not really be there? Yeah, don't miss, don't, and I'll let you answer, but don't misinterpret. We're not like hoarding paper. Our paper is being consumed. We're just having to get a aggressive ahead of it so that we're not running short. So, so one of the problems that we're facing is our inventories are a little bit higher than they were last year, but the primary reason for that is because more than half of the paper that we order shows up late. And if, show, if it shows up after the press date, we're spending half of our resources just trying to triage that event because one of our main goals is to find alternative paper and to put it on press. But the, but the basic inventories are very similar to what they were last year. One of our concerns is, and we're watching very closely, where the inventory level is going to go because as soon as, one of the signals that we're watching, as soon as customer supplied paper goes up by a couple of weeks compared to what it is today, that's gonna to be a signal that the entire market is loosening up a little bit and that act right there by boosting inventories by an additional 30 days or 45 days, of which we don't have the warehousing space to accommodate at all, but that right there is going to artificially keep the paper price up. Yes, so we all have to be very cognizant. And, and Chad, if you're also respond, or reacting to where we've asked for increased allocation in the future, it's actually because we have increased demand. And so, you know, again, it's been a tough industry, but quads, We've, we've got a lot of people who have been moving to us, which is a good thing for us, but that's causing, you know, the reason, part of the reason why we're increasing our allocations is we're growing our business in tough time because I think of the investments we've made. We announced our numbers last night. <laughs> I crashed my stock 20% this morning, um, so it's very fresh in my mind. But, um, you know, it's we're, we're going to, and we're also getting customers who did supply paper asking us to take it on. Because of that, you know, when you're too small, it's going to be hard to kind of manage those sort of different uh, scenarios you talked about. Yeah, I th just think all of us as paper buyers need to make sure that we're buying for what we need because these prices aren't sustainable and we don't want to extend these high prices. I think we all agree in this room. Other questions or comments? Joel, I've got a comment. I mean, I think one thing that was pretty interesting from the lunch was the continued strength of the American consumer. And, you know, you hear a lot of debate out there surrounding recession. Um, and uniformly, people think there'll be a recession in Europe before there's a recession in the United States. And they were quoting a lot of statistics around um, you know, the balance sheet of corporates, the balance sheet of the consumer, um, and, you know, they feel this economy is pretty resilient. Um, it's been through a lot already, um, it, you know, and it seems like there's a bullishness that the consumer um, will continue <laughs> to do just that, consume by uh, from marketers, you know, well into 2020. And the logical backup he gave to that is that, you know, they look at their credit card levels. You know, how much debt does the consumer have? And the consumer has actually is in really good shape. Um, and, and, and some of the stimulus money that everyone got sat in bank accounts. So they do see, they, they pay attention to, okay, when do the debt levels go up on credit cards? When do the savings start coming down? And they pegged it at, um, the time to really worry about the consumer running out of gas, because that's what will trigger the recession. Um, surprisingly to me, it was 2024. And so there's, there's more juice in it for this year and next year, but 24 is when they're saying that unless there's some change, that's when they could start seeing the signs of the consumer running out of gas. 
So those were the backups. Yeah, you call me Vander Doom sometimes, so I'm probably more <laughs> and, and Kelly Vander Doom or head mother know. trucker, one of the two. <laughs> hey, Chris. Well, you know, we were talking about uh, standardized products, but the other thing that we're going to have to be talking about with all the coated paper going away is the uh, downgrading of paper. So, can you talk about that? And what it means for 2023? And then, Dave, can you talk about what that means on the production floor? Sure, Don. So, <clears throat> at the end of this at the end of this year, a major paper machine is going to be taken out of production. So, we're going from 950,000 tons today down to 665. That's down from 1.2 million in the third quarter of last year. So almost 50% is evaporating in a already sold out market. Well, the secular decline has not been 50%. So what's gonna happen next year? We're in the process right now of getting every pound of coated paper that we can get, but it's simply likely not going to be enough. At the same time, we are talking with all of our SuperCal suppliers. We're very confident in the ability to get more SuperCal lined up for next year. So once we find out how much coated we're gonna get, how much SuperCal we're gonna get, Don and I are gonna go through this process and put this big puzzle together, who gets what? Because I think that everybody should think about the simple fact that there's not gonna be enough coated paper out there next year, and some customers are going to have to be willing to introduce some SuperCal into their portfolio. Fortunately, a number of our customers that we supply for are working with us on that, so we've certainly started that process. But yeah, we I mean, have a, lot a, of work a fair, fair amount have actually, actually, um, because of requirements, have come down in paper grade. Yeah, if you look at our platform, this is not a new trend, as you all know, but if you outside a direct mail platform, we're direct mail a lot of coded free sheets. But in, in printing, 65% of our uh, paper that went through our plants was coded uh, two years ago. And uh, if you look at this year, 50% is. So 15 point decline in coded to uncoded. That, that trend is clearly going to continue as you see more capacity coming out. It does affect uh, products. It does affect runnability of those products. We have to run the presses slower with an uncoated sheet. It's not as strong. It more web breaks. It consumes more ink. You, you know, and so with the, the movement to SuperCal, SCA, SCB, you know, we're, we're striving for ways. How do we stay, how do we make that paper just as productive as what the coated paper used to run? And that's where we're looking at where, where we have to put investment in to support our customer base as it moves forward from the inevitable of less coated paper, more uncoated paper. Chad? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I, I, was this helpful to give you this background and, and sort of give you the transparency and, and all that? <laughs> you know, I think, I think, please, we, we've got a lot of resources here yet today. You saw across the hall. You've seen the people up here. And when you leave here, don't, don't forget to tap into us. To just ask some of these questions because we do see uh, things on a bigger scale sometimes that maybe you can see. And by the way, don't just rely on us. Use every data point you can these days um, because it, it, it's a crazy world. But, but with that, you know, I am very proud of our team. And a lot of you know a lot of the quad people. And we continue to invest in our people, as you saw, trying to tackle the labor problem. But we just have a really good team. And I just want to tell you that as the CEO, and I get a lot of comments from you all, I'm just very proud of how they've handled it, but also proud of how they continue to sort of think creatively on behalf of our clients so that we can continue to make these bumps in the road less apparent to you. And so with that, thank you guys for joining me up here. And We'll get you off of uh, to your paper meeting uh, six minutes early there, Chad. <laughs> Thank you.